So I'm not going to come and speak to us now. I'll just pray. Is that okay? Oh, I am. Yeah. It'll keep me from collapsing. <laughs> is, uh, <coughs> is that a rough week? <laughs> it's not a rough week, I. So, Father, I just pray for strength for Arnold, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that uh, you'll fill him with your power, Lord. I thank you for these words. I thank you, Arnold, it's a gift to our church. And I just thank you, Lord, for what you put inside him, Lord. Help it uh, challenge our thinking and move us forward. And I just ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Right. Uh, Duncan, I'm going to break one of the cardinal rules I was told at Theological College. So never start speaking with an apology because it puts people on a negative. But for people to think, oh, Arnold Bridges has been an antisocial beggar this morning. It's because I haven't been well. And uh, I'm trying, I'm, I'm being green and I'm conserving my energy. <laughs> and when people have been trying to hug me, I'm like this because I'm very sore all over from coughing and that. And uh, for those of you who are like, oh, why has he got his hat on? Because I'm cold. <laughs> so uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to leave it on. Uh, if, you, uh, if you want to join the reading, um, I'm, I'm looking at the, the Gospel of John. So that's the, the second part of the Bible that we call the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <coughs> and John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter, the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved and, they, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb and they, they were both running. But the other disciple outran Peter, reached the tomb first, bent over, looked in at the strips of linen line, never didn't go in. Simon Peter came along behind him, went straight into the tomb. So um, as you can see, they, they've kind of arrived there now. Peter saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head and the cloth was lying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went inside, so unbelieved. But they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying and as she wept, as she, she bent over to look into the tomb, saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? Oh, she said, they've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you were looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in, Arabo in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, don't hold on to me, for I've not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brother's. And tell them, I'm ascending to my father and to you a father, to my God and to you a God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Oh, I'll try to start to go and do that now. There we go, that's better. Lovely. Hmm. Comrade Duncan. I have to thank my wife, may she live forever, because uh, I was pondering on, on what I'd speak this morning, because I thought, well, I'll still be in line with Duncan and the characters and all this, and I was building up to some mighty warrior of God, you know, slain thousand and defeated and parted waters, all this kind of thing. And Sister Andrew went, you know, his mother's dead, aren't you? May, may she be always exalted. <clears throat> Naturally, I did, but I didn't let on. No, not to spoil the surprise. 
and it's coming up to Easter. At this stage, I was ready to give her a bobby ball, you know, <laughs> like you do. And uh, I thought, what a combination. Because you've really got to mention Easter, and you all know what I'm going to speak about. And Mother's Day. And then the exalted one said to me, maybe you could preach about the lady in the Bible. Well, being filled with mighty prevailing love, Alice and I went to bed that night. <clears throat> and the Lord dropped into my mind Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Dave's going to bring her up for me now. Mary Magdalene. Mildly controversial. Is Mary the first Easter apostle? Is Mary Magdalene the first Easter apostle? Just bring my next one up, Dave. These are some actresses who played Mary Magdalene over the years. So starting from the, how did we do this, Duncan? Top left? All right, top right? Depending which side you are. The older lady over there, that's Anne Bancroft. Anybody recognize? No, she's the lady more famous for being Mrs. Robinson in The Graduate. Now the other lady next to her, if you click there, the names will come up. The lady next to her, Monica Bellucci, she, she's inspector with Daniel Craig, and she was part of the uh, Matrix series. The little lady there, Melcy, the Spice Girl, she was singing Mary Magdalene, Jesus Christ Superstar. Elizabeth Tabish, she's Mary Magdalene in The Chosen, which some of us have been following on TV, but my favorite is down on the bottom end there, Rooney Mara. Mary Magdalene, is she the first Easter apostle? Why have all these actresses <coughs> taken her part in all of these different films? She occurs a number of times in the Holy Scripture, especially in the New Testament mainly, which hopefully will appear shortly. You can see that most of them most of them had to do with the cross, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And the one about her deliverance from spirits. The town of uh, Magdala, or modern-day Migdal, actually is still there on the shore, the Sea of, of, sea of Galilee. Some historians, Duncan, think that the name refers to the town's fish preservation employment. And therefore, Mary may have been involved and prominent in the business of the town. She was certainly prominent in Jesus' life and ministry because she is always the first one mentioned of Jesus' women disciples. She appears to have been a lady of strong faith and steadfast loyalty it's recorded that Jesus exercises seven demons from her. There's no sign at all of promiscuity or a rock and roll lifestyle. So to be honest about it this morning, Mary Magdalene, the penitent prostitute, as she's often portrayed, or uh, if you want to be really controversial, the wife of Jesus, neither of them fits New Testament evidence, which in fact shows a devoted follower and a noticeable lady, a women disciple. If you remember what Alison said the other week, you know how stunning and prominent that would have been in a male-oriented culture. She was present at Jesus' crucifixion and his burial. Luke depicts her as possibly wealthy. She resources and supports and serves Jesus' missional ministry with her presence and her substance. But regardless of her wealth, her demonization would have been a spiritual and social affliction. She would have, in fact, have been a total social and spiritual outsider. It's very interesting that Magdala would have been by the Sea of Galilee, sure, and 
often in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, but it carries over into the New as well. The sea, both in creational stories and in end stories, is often the focus place of the evil and chaos powers that people believed existed in the universe. And therefore, Mary's healing would have displayed Jesus' authority over those forces of evil and chaos. Now, this might strike us as a bit, well, off. But in Jesus' day, there were all kinds of assumptions going on about physiological or mental or personal disabilities. Some people maybe thought that the fact that you had a disability actually represented a deficiency in your character as well. The Greeks, the Romans, and Second Temple Judaism tended to read people's disabilities and conditions religiously negative. Maybe they were divine judgments or warnings. A child born with a, phys a visible physical disability was possibly dis perceived as a divine omen. And the New Testament depicts many long-suffering individuals, often solitary. Their disabilities, struggles, they're often living limited lives with very little helpful community support. <coughs> Into this situation bursts Jesus and his ministry. You see, firstly, Jesus never considers his power acts ends in themselves. They are, for him, part of his kingdom of God, missional ministry, and prophecy. And if we could use about Jesus the language of modern disability activism, Jesus was always people first. He had a people first perspective. He always viewed people, however outwardly or, or not, whole or unable, are still God-imaged people. When they were brought to him, they were always more than their disability. They might need healing and forgiveness. They certainly needed inclusion in the kingdom of God. And Jesus' ministry was all about bringing people to that. So when Jesus brings release to Mary Magdala, it's no surprise to us to find that her discipleship is more than words. Her Jesus transformation creates an, arc, an active participation. Generous, dedicated giving of herself and her resources to support the ministry of Jesus. I wonder where we are on that scale this morning. I wonder what's our response to the transforming ministry of Jesus. Some people might be sitting there thinking, I didn't know he had a transforming ministry. But he does. The pages of the New Testament are littered with it. Is Mary then showing us that an encounter with Jesus doesn't just affect us passively. I go so far as to say that you can't have a passive Jesus experience. Because when you meet him, he turns your life inside out, upside down, and then sets it back in the right place. But the only real response to that is response. Now let me be, some people might think, not like on at Bridges, this provocative. Jesus transforms us for much more than sitting in church on Sunday. Jesus transforms us so that we can be community transforming people. Now, you might think, oh, well, that sounds a big ask. Well, it's not really, is it? I mean, all of us know a few people. 
How long would it take to transform a community? So let me ask again, regardless of where we are this morning in terms of, say, age or health or thinking, have we had a Jesus transformation and is it creating in us an active participation in the ministry of Christ? One of the most awkward things that has stuck with the church over years and years and years, Duncan, is this strange idea that, of course, it's all right for Arnett Bridges to shoot his mouth off. He's an ordained minister. Actually, we're all ordained ministers, if you read the New Testament, probably. That's why I ask, how are you participating in the ministry of Christ? Now, not everybody's got a bigger gob, a bigger, as big a gob as I've got, have they? Thanks be to the Lord. Some of us would never get a word in edgeways. But what I'm saying is there are other ways, if I could quote the old Methodist covenant service, Alison, just for a moment, for us ex-Methodists, you know, Jesus has many services to be done. And he wants disciples to do them. So let me just leave that one with you and me this morning. Where are we in that spectrum? Mary had a transforming encounter with Jesus, and it led to active participation. Well, that were a bit of a controversial thing. Is she the apostle's apostle? Well, let's examine. Is she the apostle's apostle? The word apostle simply means someone who's sent. As a title for the 12, Jesus' 12 disciples, <clears throat> It develops from the call and the narratives, the stories and acts. But actually, Mary Magdalene does have some of the criteria of an apostle. She attends and is with Jesus in his lifetime. She experiences resurrection experience, and she's certainly a resurrection proclaimer. The same is true, isn't it, that we see that this was the very message preached in the very early chapters of Acts. Christ is the Lord Messiah, crucified according to the scriptures and raised on the third day. So is Mary Magdalene an apostle to the apostles? I would say yes, she is. You see, Mary is part of the Jesus disciple group. She's following him, not only in his ministry, but to his cross and to his burial. Mary actually finds and sees the empty tomb. She may textually have been the first. She is certainly the first, hearing Jesus' resurrection self-testimony. In other words, Jesus testifying to his own resurrection. He does it first to her. And she is therefore the first risen Christ eyewitness of and to Jesus' resurrection event. For her, Jesus in that moment, in that garden, becomes the risen Lord. And Mary Magdalene, in that resurrection encounter with Jesus, opens up, we might even say, reveals a whole load of other things for us, doesn't she? Firstly, you notice, she gets her resurrection encounter before she offers anything on Easter morning. You see, here's a remarkable thing about God as he shows himself in Jesus. The God who is profound, trinity, self-giving, outward-facing, others regarding love. He will do something for you and me before we offer him any response at all. Now, of course, we preachers have a technical little name for that, Duncan, which is scattered all throughout our New Testament, just called grace. And all it means is God in front. Jesus shows this tremendous love. In fact, the Gospels go further. They say the Father sends the beloved Son to die for us. When? While we were hostile to him. 
skeptical about him. He comes to heal and restore that ruptured us and him covenant which has existed since we decided we would navigate life independently of him. That little fact that the Bible calls sin. See, in the Bible, sin is a broken relationship long before it's a set of behaviors. And Jesus, in that gracious, costly, obedient, healing, restorative love, is telling you and me, as he told Mary Magdalene in that garden, fundamentally, the character of our God will stop at nothing to heal us and make us right. In this love, God so desires connective intimacy with us that he crosses the universe. As one writer on, on these matters puts it, he implodes. He implodes and he empties himself into a real God on the street humanity, renewing his connection with us and creation because he wants to create a connective, communicating community between the seen and the unseen realities. He wants experiencing that love shown in the risen Christ to reshape your understanding and mine of him and of ourselves and frankly of the universe we live in on every level. Her renewing resurrection experience. Jesus makes her out of that experience. Jesus makes her the mediative representative of his revelation. That sounds a mouthful. All right, I'll put it in simple language, shall I? Her witness will impact the witnessing community. She's going, Jesus says, to go and tell the apostles, I've seen the Lord. It was the first Easter sermon and it was made up of four words. I wonder where we are on that spectrum this morning. Are we involved, really involved in the witnessing community? So that she, they, us are going to carry and communicate Jesus to others. In sending Mary Magdalene, in effect, Jesus is sending all of us, isn't he? <coughs> claim All of us who claim a connection with him. And why does he send us? Simply so that other people may know what we know. Other people may hear and discover what we have found in him. She's the apostle's apostle because she's given a risen Jesus commission and honor. She's the first sent and obedient witness. She is the first authentic Easter evangelizer doing the first evangelization and bringing the first evangelical message it's as simple as this the Lord is risen it's the good news it's the good news of Jesus resurrection and she goes to the apostles obediently fulfilling the, re the risen Jesus' mandate go Mary he says go to my brothers go and say so she went and she announced, John records, I've seen the Lord. She announced the message of Jesus' resurrection with fear and great joy. Why fear? Well, because in that morning, in that garden, Mary saw again the huge distance between immortal God and mortal humans. Joy, because in that moment, it was shown to her that God's creative power has conquered the sin and death matrix. He has overthrown the last enemy. 
Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of America, I believe, was heard to quip, there are only two things sure in life, death and taxes. Well, I don't know about taxes, but Jesus has certainly abolished the first. That's good news, isn't it? It's good news. The shroud that covers all mankind and he's torn it apart. Mary, Mary announces to the apostles the gospel that they will announce to the world. Cynthia Borgo says Mary is the first apostle because she gets the message. At that point of Jesus' disciples, Mary is the only one fully understanding Jesus' word and fully reproducing it in her own life. Her apostleship is explicitly validated by Jesus. She plays a very important role in the early church and in Christianity. Well, thanks for the history lesson. And Mary Magdalene demonstrates so much more, doesn't she? She demonstrates, of course, this morning, the awkward fact that no one who claims faith in Jesus is excused the call to follow him. Wait for it. Wherever he leads. Jesus expects that everyone will participate somehow. And that raises a question for me. I think it raises a question for us. Am I, are we, living our faith? Are we still acting out what we are hearing? You see, whatever the Jesus community, that thing that we call church is, it certainly isn't a classroom where we passively gain faith information. What's happening in here is apprenticeship. We only know Jesus, the New Testament says, as much as we live him out through the Holy Spirit's power, everyone, everywhere, every day. So let me ask you again this morning. Where are you and I in that part of the story? Do we understand again for the first time or maybe for the hundred and first time? Because, listen, we all have the battle and we all start throwing things at the Bible at this point. Oh, well, it's all right. You've always been a gobby character. Someone once asked Beth, Stephen, my mother, when she was with us, did you think you were on it was going to be a minister? No, she said, I thought you was going to end up on the stage. <laughs> Some of you were thinking, oh, the one leaving for Dodge City. <laughs> you understand what I'm trying to say here? Jesus expects that those who are caught up in his calling, and if you confess him, then you and I are caught up in his calling. And he expects us, by the power of his spirit, to live that faith and act it out. We only know him, in fact, as much as we live him out. So here's a challenge here that this woman of faith, again, shapes and brings to us this morning. Is Mary Magdalene a groundbreaking pioneer? Yes, I would say she is, yes. She's almost the first verbal witness to the risen Jesus. Listen, this girl has to go and preach to the most surprising, unbelieving audience in the New Testament or in all of Christianity. Doesn't she? She has to go and tell the disciples. They were thrilled. You think I'm being soggy, don't you? Here's the real truth about Mary's sermon. Don't get it, they didn't believe it. In fact, two of them, Peter and John, set off post haste to go and see if the tomb was actually empty. What a bunch. Well, thank God they're in the Bible, huh? <laughs> Hope for us yet then, lads, isn't it? Huh? Lads and lasses. They're a real crew, aren't they? 
You know, they didn't expect it. They didn't believe it. But they never forgot it. You see, Mary now is pioneering new ministry vision. As Alison reminded us the other week, here is a woman from the disciples' circle, someone who has heard Jesus' word. If I could borrow Alison's lovely phrase, which she lifted from the Bible, she sat at Jesus' feet. She heard him speak those kingdom of God parables. She, she is having and living, proclaiming a transforming encounter. What about us this morning? I would say, Duncan, to use our dear friend, who, whose name I won't mention, Mary Magdalene is on the verge. She's on the verge. She's in a Christian kingdom of God community in which she is a movement witness. I want to raise the question for me and you this morning. Is our Christianity still moving with Jesus? Or have we become passive? Listen, let's be straight about it. We're evangelicals. We're very quick to quote to one another. Oh, be still and know the, that I am God. Which sometimes can be a subtle excuse to go in bog all, can't it? <laughs> when all is said and done. You see, that, that's not the kind of faith that Mary is demonstrating. She has sat at his feet. She has been still. But her stillness provokes her into moving with Jesus wherever he's going. Is your faith and mind still moving like that? Is our Christianity still traveling with Jesus? Are we seeing as Jesus does that life around us is pregnant, pregnant with kingdom of God, seeding possibilities? Oh, yes, I know. We're all here faithfully this morning, aren't we? You should have answered yes there because we are, aren't we? <laughs> but are we carrying Jesus? Are we carrying Jesus in his vision? Or is it true about, about us that we've come to be silently saying, well, Union Road's my church, but faith-wise, I, faith I'm staying where I am, you know. Give me half a chance, turn the clock back to an earlier time and model. Mary Magdalene's Christianity is not event or building-centered, Duncan. It's relationally developing. She didn't say yes to Jesus once. She went on saying yes. Yes, yes. Because in every one of the texts where she's mentioned, Jesus tips this girl's life over and he causes her to face change and transformative participation. This girl has to make her Jesus life count somewhere. Now, I don't know about you, but I could do with a bit more of that. Couldn't you? Couldn't we this morning do with making our Jesus life count Somewhere more. And I noticed that in all her real recognition, recognition struggles, and she does struggle to recognize him, doesn't she? But I noticed this, when Mary gets it, she's all in and she's all out. She's all in and she's all out. Now, of course, let's be straight about it. Mary didn't write canonical scripture, but she's an oral tradent. She's a live resurrection narrative source, just as Mary, the mother of Jesus, is the verbal source, I believe, of the conception and birth narratives and that marvelous piece of poetry we call the Magnificent, the Magnificat. She's certainly the source of the water to wine incident. I wonder about you and me this morning. Oh, don't be like that, Glana. We're not in the gospel. We are. We're in the fifth gospel. What? We're in the gospel that's still being written. The one that comes after the other four. Why, did you think that Jesus' ministry had finished? He's alive, isn't he? Well, uh, ministry never stops. I wonder what, how it is, Duncan, how I'm doing this morning as a fifth gospel source on my street. How are we doing as fifth gospel sources in our workplaces, in the supermarket? Some of us are even fifth gospel sources in the kitchen. Like 
Mary Magdalene, let's this morning be getting and living the Jesus message. Please, please, let's not still be seen Sunday as us and them. Let's not, despite all the gentle urging we have, still prefer talking or seeking prayer with those we've known the longest. <laughs> oh, and please, 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 if people want to stop me and have a go after, please don't bring up that hallowed old chestnut about women and preaching, for goodness sake, because whatever's happening here, a woman, a woman is being, is offering verbal testimonial proclamatory witness, isn't she? I don't know about you, sounds like a good definition of preaching to me, but there you go. <coughs> is Mary Magdalene an organic witness? Oh yes, this girl has come out of the first harvest. She is the fruit of Jesus' own transforming ministry. Ah, oh, but wait. By her Jesus' witness, she is reaching at least two more generations of believers. I believe that Mary may have gone on to work in the village Jesus people. She is sharing with others in the post-resurrection mission. She is call it, causing others through her witness to experience Jesus and to grow in her life. She is, in fact, I'm going to live in embodiment of 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. In other words, she hears from Jesus, she tells the apostles, and then she goes on and she tells others. Her resurrection Jesus encounter moves her into an apostolic movement and all people, everyone, everywhere, every day mission. Now, if you ask me to prove this, I couldn't, but... When I read Acts 1.14, I think Mary Magdalene is part of the 120. That embryo Jesus community waiting for Pentecost. She's part of the church the Holy Spirit envisions and enables to embrace continuity and change, conservatism and progressive development, stability and revolution, predictability and chaos. Heritage and renewal. The fundamentals and way out of the box thinking and living. Let me finish. Yes, please do. Hopefully I'm, I'm speaking you, Duncan, not policy, but I am hoping I'm speaking kingdom of God and Holy Spirit vision. Please, brothers and sisters, please, Let's not just be the group of people who only want Union Road for us to come to and to feed. Because frankly, even if you never have me back to speak again, frankly, if we're behaving like that, our sight of Jesus is too small and we are making it too selfish. My hope is that Union Road is going to go from a next generation church. They're all sitting out there at the minute, aren't they? <laughs> but they're not going to stay sitting out there. Duncan, I'd like us to go from a next generation, like Mary did, to a fourth generation witness. I want to see Union Road developing congregation. I want to see people like Alison and, and, and Duncan, no pressure, and the other leaders, leading a, a church plant in mission or movement. I don't know how it'll come about, but I, I want to believe that the Lord Jesus is going to give us addition. Well, he is giving us addition, isn't he? But beyond addition and incremental, I'd like to see him give us multiplication and exponential growth. Let's just start with that. Dave, don't click just a second. Let's just start with that. Come on. Before I finish, let's have an imagination exercise. You'd love one, wouldn't you? Ah, oh, go on. You're dying to, aren't you? <laughs> if a hundred new people turned up next week, 
I said, all right, then. Yeah? No, we'd have to make some adaptions, wouldn't we? These little rows, uh, we might be a bit more like a jet to holiday, mightn't we? <laughs> but we could adapt, couldn't we? All right, journey with me in your imagination. Click it again, Dave. But a month from now, a thousand new people turn up. <laughs> now we're really going to have to adapt, aren't we? But you don't want to stop there, do you? Click it again, Dave. Six months from now, 10,000 more people. <laughs> it would. It would. But the real truth of the matter is, much as I love Comrade, Comrade Mick, even if we did that, we still wouldn't be able to cope, would we? Angela and I heard a prophecy once from the young woman who gave what's now known as the Diana prophecy. It was in a, it was in a New Frontiers church. Duncan in Bolton. And she said to the ministry, she said to the minister of the church, Rob, he said what? She said, it'll be like this. When Jesus unleashes it, don't bother emptying your baptism tank, she said, because you want it every day of the week. Imagine it. Imagine it. Come on, imagine it with me. You are. <laughs> imagine us being part of a hub or chain Disciple-making movement. Say, Uncle Ronald, why are you being like this? Bit of personal testimony to finish. I'm 70. This last week, I've been as croaky and cranky, and last Monday I didn't want to get out of bed. In fact, I nearly didn't get out of bed. This is a miracle this morning. This is the best I've been all week. But I tell you what I have got. Despite my fears and my failures, and there's plenty of them, there's still plenty of them. Oh, the fire burning. Do you know what the fire that's burning is now? I want to live beyond my generation. I want to see this church live beyond my generation. I want to see it in vision, even if I don't see it in sight, four generations on. No, no, that's a bit fanatic, that Uncle Arnett. Does it read the book of Acts? Duncan's going to lead us through it in a bit. Read the book of Acts. Tell me then that it doesn't happen in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, my brothers and sisters, I love you, even though I've rattled you all up a bit this morning, and I'm trusting that you still love me. So listen. I'm, I'm stealing his thunder, or Alison's. Go forth. In the power of the Spirit, and this week, live and work to Christ's praise and glory. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>